Awesome. Good morning, church. My name is Grant Glover, and I am the interim high school minister and college director here at PCBC. We're so glad you're here to help celebrate our seniors. And before we jump into today's sermon, I wanted to go ahead and read the passage that we'll be in. We'll be in Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 23. So if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and take it out. And I'll be reading out of the ESV. And so again, that's Matthew 7, verses 15 through 23. We're going to hear the words of Jesus. This is what Matthew 7, 15 reads. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, this passage can certainly, t- certain, <laughs> certainly seem scary at times. It's kind of one of those infamous passages in Scripture. But we're going to break it down today. And what I want to start off by talking about is how it's very common in, you know, kind of American church culture, or really American society in general, to kind of rag or talk about how messed up the church is. Because it seems year after year, there are stories of pastors who either fall mightily due to pride or some kind of scandal. You know, perhaps some of you are familiar with the podcast, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, which details Mark Driscoll in his pride and the abusive way that he conducted his business, that he brought down a church of 50,000. Or perhaps you look around at, in America and you see so many, you know, prosperity gospel preachers who are making millions of dollars off manipulating people emotionally or spiritually to giving them more and more money, and it kind of makes you sick to your stomach. Or maybe you kind of find yourself trying to go find a place in Christian community, and you're going to churches, and yet every time you do, you oftentimes feel like you're being judged, that you're being watched, and you feel kind of like an outsider, and you don't quite fit in. Or even worse, it's self-inflicted, and you look at your own life compared to what's going on in the church around you, and you wonder, do I fit in? Because sometimes you may have that sick pit in your stomach when you're walking in the church because you're wondering whether or not you belong here. Wherever you fall on that spectrum that I just laid out, all of these kind of feelings and sentiments are what is causing people to leave the church in droves. And the statistics about how many people stay in church after they graduate college are really, really, really shocking. And oftentimes it's because they look at the entire situation of evangelicalism and look at the church and say, the church, all these people, they don't get it. And yet, in spite of all these feelings, what we know to be true is that the core teaching of Christianity essentially boils down to Jesus loves you. And so you can look at all these situations and hear that message, and those seem to be in tension. And when you hear these conflicting things, you begin to wonder, who gets it? Does anyone get it? Does the church get it? Or maybe even worse, do I get it? What we're really asking today is, what does it mean to grasp the core ideas and the core truth of Christianity and what that means for you? And this is a great message to preach for seniors Because before you go off to college, before you're surrounded by a different world than what you've been experiencing so far, it is very important to know that you get it and what it means to get it and to understand what the core of Christianity is teaching in spite of the messiness we see in front of us. And I think all of us have to do a bit of a gut check to make sure that we keep what is important in mind. And so we're going to see what it means to get it in Matthew 7, verses 15 through 23, which I just read. And we're just going to see three things today. The problem of doctrine, the paradox of religion, and the pattern of grace. Doctrine, religion, and grace, that's what we're talking about today. So let's get to it. We're going to first look at the problem of doctrine, and we're going to turn our attention to the problems that doctrine can create. 
And this passage in Matthew 7 is towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is going to call out two different groups of people who don't get it. And we're going to look at the first group of people who don't get it and are missing something. Look with me at Matthew 7, 15. Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. What he's doing here is he's warning the disciples, his earliest followers, who eventually become apostles and leaders in the early New Testament church, that there are going to be people who come to them in sheep's clothing appearing very religious. They will talk Christian-y. They'll look Christian-y. They will seem like they fit in, and yet they're going to be teaching things that are wrong and contrary to the core of Christianity, but because they look like they fit in, they will lead many astray. And this was a problem in the early church if you read through history. But when he says this and he warns them that this is going to happen, he actually gives them a way to discern what a false teacher or a false prophet is. How do you tell? And he says it in verse 16. You will be able to recognize them by their fruits. And whenever you see in Scripture talking about fruits, what he's talking about is a way of life, how they treat others, how they live, how they talk. That if they have wrong doctrine, what he's saying is that they have the things that are contrary to Christianity, contrary to the core, you'll eventually be able to tell by their actions over the long period of time as you observe them closely. And so right off the bat, as he gets into this part of his sermon, we see the problem of doctrine that he's talking about. And it's simply this principle. Bad teaching leads to bad living. And when you hear that, some of you may roll your eyes a little bit because I understand that that sounds really churchy. I get that. Oftentimes in the West, we think of things like doctrine, theology, and religious teachings as the problems of the world. Because oftentimes we think that those are the things and the ideologies that divide people. And if we stopped caring about those kind of teachings or doctrines that divide us and we got practical, the world would be a better place. You know, we tend to think that if we focus less on doctrine and more on economic growth or social justice, our own personal well-being, the world would be a better place and religion and teaching and doctrine gets in the way of that. And that's why oftentimes we're afraid to talk about anything like that, any type of doctrine in public, because doctrine and theology is seen as evil. And oftentimes, even in church context, Christian context, we tend to think as doctrine is divisive, so let's not care about it. But I want to explain why that doesn't quite talk about, or that doesn't really flesh out the full picture, because this is kind of a sneaky lie of postmodernism, of postmodern thought, and here's what I mean. Everybody has doctrine. Everybody has a worldview, and it very much drives how you live. Every single person is driven by what they believe, and what they believe has consequences in the actions that they carry out. And I'll show you what I mean by like a simple example. If you follow the NBA at all, you know that Steph Curry is the greatest three-point shooter who has ever lived, and it's not close. But what you may not remember is coming out of college, he was this scrawny, undersized, skinny point guard who everybody thought was just kind of a one-trick pony, and he could just, all he could do is shoot threes, he's never going to make it. But over the first few years when he's in the NBA, he begins to take more threes than anybody else ever, and he begins to shoot them further and further back, and he makes more of them than anybody else who's ever lived. And then what begins to happen is everyone realizes, oh, wait, mathematically, it's actually to a team's advantage to shoot more three-pointers to score more points on offense. And so now the entire worldview, so to speak, as of basketball has changed as teams are now trying to assemble as many three-point shooters as they can. And now kids growing up playing basketball understand that if they're going to make the NBA, they have to learn to shoot threes. And that's why, for example, you know, when I grew up in class, if I ever needed to throw away a piece of paper, you know where I'm going, we would all crumple the paper, you remember this, 
and we would fade away towards the trash can and yell Kobe, right? Every time and miss it all the time because we're not Kobe. But now that's completely gone. And instead, what you have is all these kids going to the other corner of the classroom and just heaving up pieces of paper yelling Steph. Why? Because everyone wants to be like him and the worldview of what we think about basketball has changed. If you believe that the three-pointer is now the best way to make it in the NBA, your actions follow. You seek to shoot more three-pointers. And that's a simple way of looking at what it means for worldview views to drive action. And the same thing happens with bigger things than just the NBA. And we're really talking here about this secular, postmodern, Western worldview which tells you that if you want to become free, if you want to be most human, if you want to have the most happiness, you have to become who you want to be. To remove restraints, to determine what will make you happy, whether that's sex, money, power, or fame, to throw away anything that gets in the way of that. And if you base your life on achieving those things, you'll actually find contentment and happiness and leave a meaningful and purposeful life. And as the West has adopted that idea more and more and more and have made ways for people to follow that more and more and more closely, what has happened? The exact opposite. Now what we find is we are actually more anxious, unhappy, and depressed than we've ever been. And you can see this in in studies that I read this week, like the one by Clinical Psychology Review, which says that college students are 22% more depressed than they were in 1940, and 30% more anxious than they were in 1940. I want you to think about what the world was like in 1940. We were on the brink of a world war, and now as society has become more capitalist, we have more access to technology, we have more things to make us happy, more things to stimulate our brains, and more things for us to do, and more freedom and more tolerance to do whatever we want, we're unhappier. Why? The secular worldview is not working. And graduating seniors, I hope you want, I want you to hear that very clearly. As you step into university campuses where this worldview is put forth, recognize that what it's been saying and promising, it's not delivering on it. Seeking happiness to find, seeking to find happiness and becoming a certain type of person will only lead to emptiness Because you'll either get something and then be stressed out of wanting more of it, or you won't get what you're looking for and will feel valueless and miserable because you're not becoming who you want to be. And it's because of all of this, it is because of the failure of postmodernism that mental health crisis is on the rise. Because we have tricked people that pleasure and happiness and becoming who you want to be will make you more happy and it's making them miserable. And that's why Jesus says in verse 18, a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. The secular worldview is diseased and is slowly taking us down, making us more unhappy and anxious and stressed than ever. uh, You look at young people, we're the unhappiest, most politically divided and unstable people who have ever lived. So all of that to say, doctrine is important. What you believe matters. Your beliefs change everything because bad teaching leads to bad living. A faulty set of beliefs lead to an unhappy, unfulfilling life. And Jesus is warning that there are going to be people who come and advocate something like that. And you'll be able to tell by the lifestyle and the fruits that come from that belief. And the dangerous thing is, is that this kind of worldview, the way Western culture has viewed the world, has now snuck its way into evangelical Christianity across America. This thinking has influenced the church, and it's done it by thinking this. This is kind of what we've bought into from that worldview. We've begun, we've begun to think that the gospel is not enough. If we talk about the false teaching or the implicit narrative of our day that's wrong and faulty, it's that right there. And it goes something like, look, believe the gospel is a good religious thing to do. Pray the prayer, accept Christ as Savior, and then go pursue what you really want. That's your ticket to heaven. Check that box, but then go ahead and get on to make sure your life's enjoyable. Get a good job, have an attractive partner, take vacations, do all that you want, and then you'll be happy. 
If you do all of that, then you'll finally find the life you're looking for. But here's the problem. If the gospel is true, which basically says that God in and of himself has life and looks at all of us and says, you are my son and daughter and you are lovely and wonderful in your eyes and I will accept you no matter what you do, then that is all you need to have a full life. That's all that needed. That's all that is needed. And when you think about it, if you notice every fallen pastor or every flaw you can point out in church has to come from that sort of lie. Whether people are chasing sex, chasing fame, chasing status, whatever it may be, that's what's bringing people down. And what you have to see if you have experienced any type of baggage with the church is that it's not too much of the gospel that's bringing us down. It's too little. It's buying into things that other things will bring us what we want. And what I have to obviously say is that not that anything else, it's not that chasing or enjoying the things of this world are wrong, but it's that believing that having more of them and having exactly what you want will bring you contentment and happiness. That's what actually what will lead to more unhappiness. And this false teaching here is the truest reason for your struggles. The idea that bad teaching leads to bad living, what I mean simply is that if you feel like you go weeks without ever talking to God, having a devotional, and you feel far from him, but consumed by work and constantly stressed out, it's because maybe you've started to subtly think that it's gospel plus having a good career will make me happy. Or maybe if you're constantly anxious about how attractive you are, and you're constantly thinking about that, maybe you're depending on the gospel plus validation from others. And what I don't want you to hear me say is that we all struggle at some level with that. I'm not saying you're not a Christian if we struggle with that. What I am saying is that there is something better out there than some of the things that secular culture are telling us the church has bought. Bad teaching leads to bad living, and if you truly take hold of the gospel that God has life in and of himself, it's not that you'll never struggle, but you'll live a life changed where your happiness will not depend on your circumstances. Now, that's kind of a lot. I had kind of to break down secular worldview and how it imp impacts the church. But it's important to flesh that out to see what we mean by the problem of doctrine, that false teachers, that these people don't get it. But they can look Christian-y and make you think certain things by the way they come to you. But our next point will be brief to show another group of people who don't get it. What we're going to see next is the paradox of religion. And what we're going to see is that Christianity is not an ordinary worldview, and it presents a paradox that you have to wrestle with. And Jesus moves on from talking about false prophets to now false disciples or general followers who come to him and they don't get it. So let's go ahead and read verse 21 to see. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That one is a little scary. But it gets worse. Check this out. <laughs> to understand the full gravity of this, of what this means, you kind of have to see some context. And Tim Keller makes three good observations at this point. First, what you have to see is that these people coming to him saying, Lord, Lord, have some good doctrine. Because if you know your Old Testament, you know that God revealed himself to Israel as Yahweh. That was the personal name that he gave them saying, I am now in relationship with you. And that's how they addressed him. But by the time the Greek New Testament comes along, which is what the Jews would have read in the New Testament era, because Greek was the common language, the translation of Yahweh in the Greek is kurios, which means Lord. So capital L, Lord, in your New Testament is banking on that Jewish idea of Yahweh. So these people are coming to Jesus and saying he is God. That's some good doctrine. But not only that, they have some kind of emotional attachment or an emotional investment in it because a common Greek or Hebrewism was to, if you had emotional endearment towards someone, you address them by their name twice. You see this in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel 18, where when King David finds out his son Absalom dies, he doesn't just say Absalom, he says Absalom, Absalom, and he weeps and he mourns and he grieves. When you get to Luke 10, you'll find that when Martha is struggling with anxiety and being all stressed out, Jesus calms her down and says, Martha, Martha, why are you so anxious? 
So to address somebody by their name twice was to express emotional endearment. So here comes these people saying, Lord, Lord, with good doctrine and having this kind of emotional experience with it. But then it gets worse. Then you go down to verse 22, and it says these people say this, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? So they've got some good doctrine. They know Jesus is God. They have some emotional seriousness about it. And now they're actually doing good things, mighty works. They look religious. They look moral. They're doing all of these things. And here's what Jesus says in verse 23. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I told you it was bad. (laughs) All of these religious things, all of these things they're doing led to nowhere. And it's because there's a, the way Christianity operates is not like normal religion. There's a paradox to it. Here it is. That good living does not lead to eternal living. By itself. What the Bible says is that looking a certain way, having some good theology, being emotional, or doing good things, that does not guarantee that you get to God. Just doing those things is not what guarantees anything. But you may be asking, aren't all those good things, shouldn't we be striving for them? And the answer is yes, but the problem, the reason these people don't get it, is because they don't understand quite what he's looking for. Because when he says, when he says on that day when they come to me, when they're looking to gain interest into eternal life, the first thing they point to is, look what I have done. That is their fundamental problem. And a lot of people might teach this passage and say, well, it's because they didn't do enough good things, but that's not what it's saying. What it's saying is it's, they have done those things to receive something from God. And what this is, is this is the religious version of the secular lie. The religious version is to do certain things to get something from God. That I'm defined by what I do, that if I do all of these good things, if I put in this input, I'll get this output from God. And at the end of the day, if that's how your faith operates, it's self-centered. It's about your pleasure. It's about your happiness. You're doing all those things to receive something, and you're buying into a different type of secular narrative, a religious one. And it is very, very, very possible to have some good doctrine, to have some emotional seriousness and some good deeds and completely miss the point because you're doing it not for God's sake, but yours. This is what he is saying. And I want you to hear something I'm also not saying very clearly. I am not saying that Christians should not bear fruit. This passage is talking about that The Christian life does look different in some kind of way. At some point in your life, you should expect to see good doctrine, emotional seriousness, good works following from your faith, not all the time, not perfectly, not all the time stable up and down throughout your life going through seasons and changes, but they're there to some degree. A complete lack of all of these things that these false disciples are showing probably should lead you to questions, but having all of them does not guarantee that you get to God, that you get it. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Good living, this is the paradox because it's different than the way we think, good living does not lead to eternal living. Now, some of you are thinking, Grant, you're freaking me out. (laughs) I thought that's what we were about at church. You're dragging on all of these things people are doing. How do I know if I get it? Who gets it? Does anybody get it? What's going on? Let's land this plane, and we'll see actually how simple it is to get it. And what we're going to see in our last point is this, the pattern of grace. This is now we will turn after two groups of people who don't get it to see what it means to get it, the core of Christianity. Because Jesus has basically said that you have these false prophets and teachers who are very religious, and you have these false disciples who appear very religious, but they're both missing the point, and they don't get it, because he says in verse 23 again, he'll declare to them, I never knew you depart from me. Now, again, what he's not saying is you haven't done enough to warrant me, 
or that you're not showing enough fruit. No, what he's saying is that in spite of all these religious doings, I never knew you. Not from the beginning did I ever have a relationship with you. He wasn't wanting them to do more things, but he wanted them to not be doing all these things to earn his favor, but out of a relationship. And you can see this clearly when you really unpack verse 21, where again he said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And I remember first reading this passage and seeing Whoever does the will of my father is like, oh gosh, maybe I need to be doing more than what I'm doing to gain entrance. That's what I've always thought. But it's not, that verse is not talking about striving to appease God, but submitting to his will. And submitting to his will is something more complicated than just doing good things. Because what you have to see is that doing the will of the father is not obeying to get something from him, but obeying because of what you have received. To do his will is to receive what he has given, and that is his own son's life. This is what it means to submit to the will of the Father, is to understand that rather than God asking us to be a certain way, to have a certain religious view of ourselves, to be moralistic, what he wants is for us to understand that Christ came and gave himself on our behalf. That in response to all of our flaws and failures, instead of of making us pay the punishment for them. He has Jesus come and die on the cross for those things so that he gets the punishment that we deserve for what we did so that we might get the reward he deserved for what he did. It flips the secular narrative. It flips the religious narrative on its head. To submit to the will of the Father is to submit to that message and that identity about yourself because it's the exact opposite of what we normally think. Because religion says, I obey, therefore I am accepted. And the gospel says, I am accepted, therefore I obey. God declares you good enough on the front end because of what Jesus did, not because of what you do. And the fundamental driver, the fundamental principle behind all of this to fully get it is grace. To fully understand what Christianity is all about, to fully try to make sense of what's going on in the American church, you must get grace. And to get grace, you've basically just got to understand two things. You are more evil than you ever dared imagine, but more loved and accepted in Christ than you ever dared dream at the same time. You're flawed, you're broken, but that doesn't define you. What Jesus did define you. And when we see this, we finally understand what it means to get it. You finally see the pattern of grace. That grasping grace is actually what leads to fruitful teaching and fruitful living. It's the grasping of grace. Christianity does not say work harder to be a better person by sheer effort, but by understanding grace, something changes. And the best way for me to explain this and its implications is with a story. If you remember from your history class, there was a guy named Martin Luther who nailed the 95 Theses, this piece of paper, to the door of a Catholic church in Germany, and he starts the Protestant Reformation. And he becomes this hero of the faith of sorts, even though he's kind of a broken character at times. But before the whole Reformation, he actually was a, basically kind of like a monk who spent his entire life trying to basically beat the sin out of himself, sometimes quite literally. He strived and strived to be sinless, be perfect, and be good enough to appease God and be religious. And that was his entire view of what it was. And the day everything changed and what led to the Protestant Reformation was this. He was in Romans 1, and here's what he wrote. I was laboring diligently and anxiously as to how to understand Paul's words in Romans 1.17, where he says the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. I took it to mean that righteousness whereby God punishes the unrighteous, and I had no confidence that my own heart could possibly merit not being punished. Then I grasped that the righteousness of God is that righteousness through which grace and sheer mercy God gives us through Christ in faith. Therefore, I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise when I saw the difference that the law is one thing and the gospel is another, I broke through. 
That's what it means to get it. To break through is not to be better. He did not have some kind of emotional experience. He did not all of a sudden reform his entire lifestyle. He was already quite a good person. What he recognizes is that I am broken in desperate need of grace and forgiveness. And that's how he got it. And his life looked differently as a result. Not more religious, not more in, this, in that kind of sense. But he's able to rest in what God did and not try to attain anything on his own. And that right there is the point. What makes you get it, how you know you get it, how to look at a church, how to look at people know that they get it, is to grasp grace. To know that the Christian life is not one of being looking a certain way to people externally, nor is it about being perfect, but about falling into the arms of grace over and over again. The Christian life is one where you realize that you're helpless, that you actually don't have enough fruit, that your doctrine is not good enough, that you're often not emotional enough, but you, and you often don't even live good enough, but again, you fall back into the arms of Jesus and into the arms of grace and forgiveness over and over and over again and know that defines you and nothing else. If he truly died, if God in Christ truly died so that his life and goodness count for yours, and you see how messed up you were that he had to do that, You'll get grace. And right there, that actually should be a huge relief because this is the key. This is how you know you get it, the pattern of grace. If you understand that you don't get it, that you don't have it all together, you get it. That's grace. If you're blind, if you know you're blind, you see. If you know you're sick, you're healthy. Grace changes everything, and it will truly bring about real unselfish fruit in your life because it changes everything about the way you view yourself. And so maybe some in the room need to grasp that grace for the first time, and we are happy to talk to you afterwards about what it means to do that. But a couple quick things to close. Number one, for my believers in the room, stop questioning the amount of fruit in your life and beating yourself up about it and trying to beat the sin out of yourself like Martin Luther. What I'm not saying is that we not, ought not to pursue holiness or ought not to pursue trying to live better lives. But too many times we are guilting each other and guilting Christians in that they're not Christian enough, that you're not enough. Don't guilt yourself. Don't go beat the sin out of yourself. Instead, when you fail, go get, grasp grace again and again and again. See that God has life in himself and see what he has said about you and let that and watch it melt your heart. Because when you get grace that you've been given so many things that you don't deserve, that changes what you want to do with the rest of your life. That's where the fruit comes from, falling back into grace over and over again. And secondly, to wrap up, as I talked about at the beginning, we oftentimes it's easy for us to sit back and see the flaws in churches and ministries in America, and there are plenty to talk about, and there is plenty of work to do. But once you see grace for yourself, you can't help but have to see it for the church too. Because yes, the church is full of dumb, broken sinners like us. That we're everywhere. And we are so quick to disengage from church, to call it wrong and bad. And yeah, sure, there are things that we can change. However, if God can look at people like us, give his life for ours, and show us grace over and over and over again, no matter how much we fail, no matter how many times we turn away from him, if he's going to keep showing us forgiveness over and over and over again, then we've got to find it for the church too. Once you see grace for yourself, you can see how there can be grace for other people in the church. That is the pattern of grace. To not get it is to get it. Cling to grace every day. That's what it's all about. Let us pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. I thank you for all of the seniors in the room who you have brought up faithfully in this church and who have been poured into by so many and you have done so much in their lives. I pray that your hand will be upon them in their next phase of life, that they would just see your graciousness and your kindness and your goodness, that you've got life, and that that would be what motivates them going forward and they would see you more and more clearly and that you would do the same for all of us. If there's anyone in the room who does not understand what it means to grasp grace, show them. If there are any believers in the room who are struggling to have grace for themselves, let them have grace for themselves. And let us all see how good you are 
how gracious you are and that that would melt our hearts and our lives would just look differently as we continue to grasp on to what you've done. In your name I pray, amen.